everyone. I am so excited to be here once again with One Young World. I think it's so inspiring to see how we have already made so much change in our generation, and this is just the beginning. And today, we are going to be talking about the ocean. So I would love to introduce uh, Dr. Sylvia Earle, um, who is one of my role models. We've actually met since I was a freshman in college in 2014, and we've been on this journey together ever since. And as many of you know, she's an explorer, she's a lecturer, and she's just an amazing role model for, for all of us. So I will jump into questions now. Thank you. Okay. So, Sylvia, there is a lot to discuss today, but I'd love to start with talking about why the ocean. There is a lot of conversation about the importance of land and how we can decarbonize our planet with the trees and with planting, uh, you know, a lot of ground soil. But, like, why the ocean? How can the ocean play a role in helping save our planet? <laughs> how can the planet help save the ocean? <laughs> How can we, the one species that has undeniably caused the degradation of the land and the sea, consuming nature to foster our prosperity? It's something that began the beginning of humankind using the natural systems for what we eat, what we wear, places that we live. And you can see tangibly what we've done to the land. It's less obvious what has happened to the ocean. It's been more obvious to climate scientists and others to say trees, carbon-based units, animals, birds, carbon-based units, the connection to nature on the land seems increasingly obvious. Even giving carbon credits to keep trees in the ground really makes sense to me. But what about the ocean, you ask? That's where most of life on Earth actually exists. It's where most of the carbon exists. Economists tend to follow the money. Climate scientists follow the carbon. And that leads us right into the ocean. When you think about fish, squid, shrimp, whales, you name it, they're all like us. We're all carbon-based units, too. <laughs> and we have we've, we've assembled so much of the, what it makes the world function as the biogeochemical miracle that it is and turned it into buildings, into agriculture. You know, nearly half of the world has been converted of the terrestrial part of the world to agriculture and has a big carbon cost associated with it. The destruction of forests in order to have the animals and the other organisms, the plants that we consume. Okay, now the ocean. At the World Economic Forum in 2020, uh, there was a study that was released by economists <laughs> who looked at whales for their carbon value, the way we have been looking at trees for their carbon value. And they came to the conclusion that putting a dollar sign on whales for their carbon came to at least a trillion dollars of carbon. Blue carbon is the name now being given to life in the sea. And it isn't just whales. If it works for whales, it works for tuna swordfish, cod, shrimp, squid, plankton, all life in the ocean, coral reefs, kelp forests, seagrass meadows, mangroves. It's the fabric of life that we need to be aware of how the connection of the living planet to climate. It isn't just rocks and water. It's the fact that Earth is alive, that we have an ocean, that we have, therefore, the climate the temperature and the chemistry that makes Earth habitable for us, and it's now at risk. So, we're making some progress on the land of connecting the protection of forests, birds, and other wild places 
wildlife and wild places to climate and to the protection of the diversity of life. But most of the diversity of life is in the ocean, far and away. You know, only about half of all of the major divisions of animal life, of which vertebrates, chordates, creatures with backbones, that includes us and birds and frogs and reptiles and such, fish. <laughs> but when you think about it, there are at least 30, probably closer to 35 different categories, major divisions of animal life. All of them have representation in the sea. Only about half occur even in the richest rainforests in the place you could embrace with your arms, in a coral reef or a kelp forest, or even in the open sea, you can find pretty close to half the number of all of the animals that exist, of categories, diversity on the mega scale. Now the splintery ends that we call ends that we call species, <laughs> we've we've done a lot more looking on the land than we have in the ocean. We're just beginning. To, to understand the diversity of life in the sea, but we do know that we're, we're way behind in terms of understanding the individual species that make up these big categories. <laughs> so, the precautionary principle, protecting areas that you just leave alone. The creatures we don't yet know even on the land, in the soil, in, in parts, parts of the planet that are a little explored, even in deserts, there's enormous diversity that makes Earth special. And I love the fact that on our watch right now, we've, as never before, being, we see scaling up of protection, respect for nature, and making the connection between climate, planetary chemistry, and the need to protect the great systems of life that are rapidly disappearing, but we're putting on the brakes and beginning to really protect, aiming for at least 30% by 2030. Got a long way to go, but we shouldn't stop there. Absolutely, and you have seen so much being an explorer. You are the first woman to literally walk on the ocean floor, and, and I almost wish that all of humanity had that perspective because if we could see the damage we are creating in the ocean, we would not be having this conversation about why the ocean matters. We would know why it matters. We would know what's happening. So Sylvia, what can governments do? What can the international community do to actually act on climate and ocean right here and right now? I love the fact that we're looking at an international community where the action really is. I love the fact that you, 195 countries represented here, you're coming with, with good humor, with, with real friendship and expectations that you're here to make a difference. I go to the United Nations meetings. I go to government sessions. I go to sessions where a lot of different so-called stakeholders <laughs> get together to try to carve up the world. But uh, often the spirit is not like what I see here. Collaboration, cooperation, trying to figure out where's the common ground, not how can we put down the other guy so we can be stronger or better or whatever. So reason for hope right here that I'm looking at. But here's the thing. Every one of us, whoever we are, wherever we live, we have a stake in the future of nature, the future of the ocean. In my lifetime, nations with a coast have staked out territory in the ocean that they claim as the exclusive economic zones going out 200 nautical miles so that my country, the United States, is actually twice as big as what you see on a map. Small island countries, so-called, are actually big ocean countries. Even Australia is twice as big as the Australia you see on maps when you extend out. And Indonesia, the 
you know, largest island country, many islands make it up, extend their exclusive, exclusive economic zone out, it becomes significantly larger. Costa Rica, coastal country, grows by 10 times if you include the part that is now blue, not just land. Beyond that, high seas. Who owns the high seas? Well, humans think, of course we do. Whales, dolphins, coral reefs, fish, if you ask them, <laughs> they'd probably give you a different answer. <laughs> Why do these terrestrial creatures think they own the ocean? Why do they call it our ocean instead of the ocean? That if it belongs to anybody, it belongs to everyone. It's our common life support system. Whether you're a deep sea fish or an albatross flying over the ocean or a desert rat, you are all connected to the ocean and have a stake in keeping the ocean healthy. Right now, five nations disproportionately are extracting wild animals, fish, squid, shrimp, you name it, from the high seas beyond national jurisdiction. Many nations are involved, but five take 85% of the wild animals that are living in the ocean. The biggest wildlife trade on the planet we call seafood. We don't give sea animals names the way we do cows, chickens, and pigs, at least we Yet they represent basically single species. But what's a fish? <laughs> 33,000 kinds of animals are known as fish. We see lobsters. What kind of lobster are you? There are at least 100 different kinds of lobsters. And we just lump them together and measure them by the ton. That has to change if we are to successfully address climate, to successfully address the diversity of life if we are to successfully have a planet that works in our favor. We've gotten into the habit of looking at animals in the sea as products, whales as barrels of oil and pounds of meat, looking at shrimp, looking at squid, some of the most amazing animals on the planet, octopus. If you have not seen The Octopus Teacher, a little film, it's on Netflix, that describes how one person got acquainted with one octopus, <laughs> a little bit like Jane Goodall getting acquainted with chimpanzees, but this creature doesn't have four appendages, eight legs, and a big brain. And he somehow can't think about octopuses the same way again, or our relationship with other forms of life that don't have a backbone, or even those that do, like fish. I just think that if you, you representing a cross-section of humankind, the nations of the world, could just dive in, make it a priority, get to know your blue backyard and the creatures who live there, and treat them with dignity and respect, and understand their lives matter, our lives matter. But if we don't treat nature in ways that that really honor their existence. Treat them with compassion. Treat them with wonder, because it's necessary for us to change our habit of just looking at wild things, land and sea, as something that's useful to us as, as products or as food. If we are to have a planet going forward that works in our favor, we have to treat nature, including the blue part of the planet, with greater dignity and respect. Thank you, Sylvia. And it really all starts with us here. And in, in the spirit of, of storytelling, I think that you know when you consider the doom and gloom that currently exists in the climate space, we have to move away from that. No one wants to be depressed. No one wants to have climate anxiety. We have to begin to be hopeful. 
and to celebrate those champions, those ecopreneurs that are building these amazing climate and ocean tech companies that are going to benefit the environment and our planet. And we have to idolize them instead of celebrities that are just destroying the planet. So really thinking about how we shift our messaging and storytelling is so critical. And I implore all of you to make the ocean part of the climate conversation. We don't have any more time to waste and we all have to go all in. Because no matter what sector you're in, if you are in education, if you are in, in trying to solve for poverty, if we don't have a livable planet, we can't solve for anything. And so when we consider the repercussions and the fact that our generation is the last generation to be able to do something tangibly to save us all. That's power. It's power and it's responsibility for all of us here. And so we as you know, ocean champions and we dedicate our lives to saving the ocean, we ask all of you to join us on this journey. Use your skill set, use your passion, use your voice and never stay quiet because we need to demand more from corporations, from governments and from ourselves. What more can we do? So I have a question for you. And that is, what role does storytelling have in achieving the problems, solutions to the problems you've just identified? Well, I think we need to find more role models. And we need to find people that are actually on the ground building these innovative technologies. And we also need to look for diversity and inclusion in everything that we do, especially in the climate space. At SOA, we've supported over 7,000 young leaders. We've funded them, we've accelerated them, and we have 270 ocean solutions that are out literally in the ocean right now, working to solve these problems. So, and so I think that for all of us here, continue the conversation. We cannot stay quiet anymore. It's our future and it's our responsibility to truly act. So what advice would you give individually and collectively to those assembled here? What, what you know, walk out of here, what kind of, uh, Oomph, can you, can you, you know, sprinkle among people to say, okay, here's a recipe to make a difference. What would it be? So one of the quotes that keeps me going is one from Martin Luther King, and he says, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But no matter what, just keep moving. And for <laughs> And I think that as intimidating and scary and painful as this climate crisis is for all of us, because I'll admit it, there are sleepless nights, there's moments where I'm just in tears because of all the catastrophe I witnessed, but we can't give up. It really is up to us, no matter where we are in life, Start somewhere, yeah. build a community, bring your idea into to the fourth, to the, to, to the table. Just keep going because we need you. We all are all in this together. And I think that would be my piece of advice. You know, you know when you think about it, uh, uh, look at things that have happened that have brought us to where we are. And you peel back the layers of how did we, how did the telephone come to be? How did airplanes get developed? How did we learn the languages that we have? And as you dive back into history, you usually find that there's somebody who got it started. Mm -hmm. Someone did something, but they didn't do it alone. It took to go to the moon. We celebrate the great heroes that put their footprints on the moon, but they did not get there by themselves. It took an <laughs> amazing amount of current engineers, scientists, and industry, and science, all that, plus all that has gone before that got us to the current level of knowledge that enabled us to 
achieve what is now achievable that could not happen a century ago or even 50 years ago. You really are blessed with unprecedented knowledge. It's, I think, my answer partly to the question I pose to you is tap into that knowledge, but don't think that that's all there is. We're just beginning to get our minds around the magnitude of what we don't know, how much more there is to discover, and what you can do, every one of you, using whatever is special to you. And to realize that as we sit here, there are others who are gathering to carve up the world, to carve up the ocean. And there are two issues right now that regard the high seas. Biodiversity of life on Earth that is concentrated in the ocean, and the deep sea, deep sea mining that is this year, in this 12-month period, decisions are being made that will determine the fate of so much of the planet. Please keep an eye on them, those who are making decisions. Use your voice, use your knowledge, use your influence to, to really put people on the line. So you know that this is, this is make or break time. We will protect the processes that make Earth habitable, climate, chemistry, biodiversity are on the line. And we need all of you to join us on this journey. So thank you so much, Sylvia, for our time together. And thank you all of you for being here with us today. That was wonderful. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Daniela. What a wonderful conversation. Thank, thank you so you much. Thank you so much.